What's up guys, it's Coach Drew, and today we're gonna to talk about perimeter defense, both guarding the triple threat and live ball situations. So obviously there's a ton of content out there that works on every aspect of offense, but very rarely, uh, you know, is defensive explained, and it's so much because there's so many different schemes out there, and so whatever your coach teaches you, is first and foremost the most important thing. What I'm gonna show you guys in this video is how to be a better kind of one-on-one -on -one stopper. So there's so many different aspects of defense. You have your team defense, which trumps everything. And then you have that individual stop where it's just you and the other player and there's kind of, you know, big time spacing and you just have to get kind of that lockdown stop to help your team out. So if you're in that situation, these are some of the different teaching points that you can rely on. But again, if your coach is teaching you to, you know, really force baseline or really force middle or guard a certain way, that obviously trumps whatever I'm saying because he's probably built a whole system and scheme around that. Saying that, if you've got a guy in an isolation situation and you're playing him and he's in triple threat, the first thing I like to do is take away his normal pocket. Now when I say normal, most players are more comfortable if they're a right-hand player on their left pivot foot with the ball in their left pocket. So they feel comfortable, if you're right here, they really feel comfortable kind of jabbing and, and really extending the jab where they can kind of sell the jab, they can shoot from here, they can you know jab, pull back and shoot. So they feel comfortable here. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get up on their hip and make them play out of that pocket right there which they're not as comfortable with. Now notice that now their shoulders aren't squared anymore when the ball was over here. You notice now their shoulders kind of are square to the rim, they're in a shot ready position. Whereas when the ball's over there, they're not as used to it. Most players don't practice kind of shooting from their, their dominant hip if they're a right hand player from the right hip, if they're a left hand player from their left hip. So the first thing we're gonna do is try to take away that normal kind of pocket for them. The second thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure we dictate their angle. So we don't want to kind of be here where they can kind of really manipulate us and a jab allows us to go here or kind of a rip through and go here. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna push them in one direction. So right now, I'm taking away with my chest, I'm taking away middle drives and forcing him to the baseline, but I'm not giving him a direct drive downhill because then obviously he can not only get even with us, but get into us, which is gonna be a problem for us defensively. So I'm not giving him an angle, but I'm dictating the angle that I wanna give him, and I'm trying to basically channel him to a certain area, kind of the gray area, the, the short corner, if you will, in the offensive space. So now that I took away his, his normal pocket, I'm pushing him to the gray area. The next thing I need to do is know what to do with my hands. I don't wanna extend my hand because then reach through fouls are gonna happen. I also don't wanna to get to the point where I'm reaching through where he can you know, kind of sweep it up into a shot fake. I also don't wanna to get to the point where I'm reaching and I'm off balance because that's gonna ultimately give kind of an angle for him to kind of explode by. I wanna drop down my shoulders a little bit in front of my knees, active hands with my palms up. So I'm tracing the ball right here. This hand's kind of taking away the drives and sweep throughs, but I'm never having my hand extended if I do want to kind of get a hand on the ball, I'm always going from low to high. Because if I'm lower than him, he can't sweep up and get the foul. So I can do that, but I never want to go here because then if I miss, he can quickly sweep up and get that rip through foul or a shooting foul depending on what the refs call. So a couple teaching points so far. Number one, make him play out of the uncomfortable pocket. Number two, dictate the angle. Number three is palms up right here. Number four is if you're going to swipe, always swipe up and under, never swipe you know, over and down. Now that we have that, if we do force him into a rip through and he goes this way right here, a sweep, what we wanna do is we wanna keep our inside hand close to our body so we ultimately have leverage. We don't wanna get these reach in fouls. We also don't wanna control the hip where a lot of times the refs call it the youth levels. We wanna keep this hand tight so we can embrace contact and we wanna keep this hand up. That way if he tries to do a step back or anything, this hand is already up, so say he goes step back right here, boom, now we can take the bump. We can also have a contest hand that will allow us to be the second off the floor. We never want to jump and kind of, you know, embrace kind of for a, a shot fake and get a foul. So what we want him to do is we want him to jump off the floor and then when, we sh when he shoots it, go ahead and start to shoot it. We either want to alter the shot by going vertical, straight hands, or by going right here in his vision kind of triangle and contest it. If He's right here and goes in for a finish, same thing. We try to take off that angle, we're tight here so we can take a body, and then we wanna keep this hand vertical. When we take the hit, a lot of times, people will wanna go like this and reach down, and that's when they get the foul, so you take this hit, bang, keep this hand high so he has to finish through our angle right there, okay? The last thing is, what happens if he beats us on a sweep through? So say he's right here, he has the ball in that pocket, he sweeps through and say he does get past this angle. So he sweeps through, he goes this way. 
We don't want to open up right here and give him a clear path. And we also don't want to reach in and get a foul. So if he does, all we want to do is get as flat as quickly as we can so that now we can get back in kind of a race. Again, this hand's going to be embracing. He starts going this way, high hand, and I'm trying to slide. One last thing that's super important out of the triple threat is if we get beat, we don't try to just slide. We sprint back and try to beat him to a spot. So if you do say get beat this way, we don't start sliding right here and let him blow by us. What we do is run and try to beat him to a spot. So if he's here, he beats us. We're just sprinting and trying to get high hands and what would I call hollow out, which means don't get up here because that's where you can get a foul. You try to beat him to a spot, hollow out right here, which you can also use on the live ball situation, which we'll talk about in a second, okay? Now, those are the main teaching points that we have. The biggest thing that I would say is always play with your hands back, okay? Now, hands back shouldn't throw you back. It should be hands back with your chest over your knees so that you're on balance, kind of like a boxer would be. A good boxer stance is a great stance for a defender as well. If he's dribbling with the live dribble, so say he's dribbling with his right hand, we want to do the exact same things and exact same principles. We don't want to be reaching and throwing ourselves off body. We want to take away the crossover. We want to dictate an angle. The only other big teaching point that we need to have is if he starts driving, what we need to do is hollow out, which means constantly almost suck back right here so that we have space so that he can't get to our body. Because if he gets in our body, then he's going to ultimately be able to get away from us and use a step back, a bump off, or if we're right here, he can get into our body and draw a foul because a lot of times if you get hit right here, boom, then you'll end up getting that and one foul. So the concept of hollowing out on the live ball, he's dribbling, he beats us this way. We just kind of almost suck back right here, stay high hands, keep him back so we can embrace a hit, take a hit without kind of concaving in right there. And so if we keep a little bit of distance between the ball handler and us, we'll be in an advantageous position where we slow him down and ultimately let kind of everybody else kind of come over and make the play on the shot if he tries to sidestep, step back, or do something like that. So the biggest thing that you want to do is always try to stay between your man and the basket. The way you do that is dictate angles, make sure you keep a little bit of comfortable distance, don't start taking chances, just be solid. And if you do those things, I promise you, you'll be a better defender than you ever have been before. Hey guys, it's Coach Damon, and today we're going to bring you three tricks that you can implement in your game today they are going to increase your deflections and increase your steals. A lot of times when you see guys who lead the league or lead the NCAA in steals, you assume that they're just on the ball and they're always just taking the ball from the ball handler. That's not always the case and guys come up with ways where they can get deflections and get steals just by knowing the game, by anticipating what the other team is going to do, and by knowing their opponent sometimes better than what they know themselves. So with these three tricks, there are ways that depending on who you're playing, you might be able to get an extra steal or two per game just by knowing what they're going to do, what they're going to run, or how they get into their offenses three tricks that can be implemented again today. Our first trick is going to be simply stealing the inbounds pass. If you watch a lot of teams, especially at the high school level, I might finish a layup and then as soon as the man gets the rebound and takes it out of bounds, he's only looking for one spot. So right now the chair is going to represent the point guard and guys will blindly step out of bounds and throw it to their point guard. So that being said, anytime you can catch somebody throwing a blind pass is a great opportunity to get a steal. So what you can do is head down the court, and if you know the ball is going right here to the point guard, go one, two, and then quickly turn right back around in front of him. This isn't something you can do every possession. It's not something that you can do on every made basket. But if you do this one or two times per game, chances are you're going to get a steal on one of them, especially at the high school level where 90% of the time the ball is being outleted to the same person. Now, you do run the risk of if you turn around and it's already been thrown or they throw it to the other side. So you have to have the self-responsibility and accountability to know that if you don't get a steal, you have to sprint to the opposite end of the court as quickly as possible. At the same time, if your coach doesn't encourage pressing and you're not allowed freedom, this isn't something you do unless you have that freedom that your coach has given to you. So you walk away, inbounds pass comes, and you quickly turn right back in front, stealing it, which is often an outlet pass for you to get a layup right at the rim. Let's take a look at it. So I'm here, I finish the layup, and I'm one, two, and I take the inbounds pass can be very, very quick. As you saw, he got out quickly. I got there quicker. He tried to inbound to who he's been inbounding every single made basket the whole game. I stepped in front. He threw it to me right at the front of the rim. Our next trick can be utilized by very quick guards when you're on the defensive end on a fast break scenario for the opposite team. 
Now, a lot of times, obviously, if you can get back in front of him, you want to beat him to the spot before he gets to the three-point line. Or if you're coming from a different angle, you want to beat to the spot and try to take a charge if it's a player who's known to be out of control. But there are times in a game where you're going to be running right side by side with that player, and it's not realistic for you to think that you can beat him to the spot for a charge, and obviously you're not going to just let him go. So a trick that you can use to take advantage of him slowing down on his last steps and to get more deflections and steals is as he attacks, more than likely on that last step before he goes up, he's going to slow down just a little bit you're still going to be at full speed. And if you can find just a little bit of extra explosion at the last second, you can dart right in front, often using your inside hand to get a deflection or at the very least throw him off balance because he didn't know what was coming. Again, this isn't something that you want to do on every fast break. If you're too close, you're going to tangle feet and it's going to be a foul on you. But if you are explosive, if you are quick and you know that he's likely to slow down on that last step, you can dart in front at the last second and more than likely, prevent an open layup. Our last trick, and this may not necessarily lead to a steal for you, but will absolutely lead to a steal for the team and a deflection, is the tip from behind. Now, I'm sure you've seen guys who, if they turn the ball over and they're getting beat down the court, they'll come chase from behind, and when the ball's left out, they'll get that deflection and they'll tip the ball ahead. You can also do that if, you were to score and the ball gets ahead of you, let's say there was a long rebound, anytime somebody is ahead of you, especially if it's your man, you can track them down and if their team's not communicating with them, they're gonna be left out on an island where you can easily tip that ball from behind. Now, it's very important. You're not trying to get a steal for yourself here. If you're the last man down the court, your entire team's gonna be ahead of you. And more than likely, if it's a good defensive team, they're gonna be seeing what's coming their way. So as you attack down court, if you hit it with your inside hand, you can knock it away to your team. And as again, if you were the last man down, if you tip it away and then immediately take off the other way, you're going to have a wide open layup because you got the tip, you caught the outlet, and what was a negative play is quickly becoming a positive one because of your hustle. All three of those tricks aren't things that you want to do every possession. They're things that you might do once or twice per game. But sometimes one or two steals or one or two deflections can be the difference between a win and a loss. And obviously you're not gonna be, even elite players aren't getting eight, nine, and 10 steals per game. If you go from three to five or, for, or from one to three, you are significantly increasing your contribution to the team on the defensive end. Three quick tricks, very easy to add, put them in your game today. Hey guys, Tim Martin here. Today I want to talk to you guys about being a better on-ball defender. I think a lot of players struggle with anticipation and being able to cut off that defender and turn them at least one to two times. But a lot of it is just by staying in a defensive stance and being able to cut them off, cut the offensive guy off on the first step. So today I want to try to help you guys try to take that to the next level. All right, so we'll come over here. All right, so one of the big theories for me as, 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 as a coach or as a trainer, I wanna to try to teach my guys who's playing on-ball defense to be disruptive. If you can learn how to be disruptive defensively on-ball, that's gonna make you more of a threat on both ends of the floor and being able to control and sustain their offense. By doing so, it's important that we know that reaching is, is never gonna do us any good. But sometimes just taking a, a slight a step or a jab at this defender could force him to pick the ball up or for, force him to kind of turn away. And when we talk about disruption, that's not allowing him to get any type of penetration. And it's also helping us lock up the wings for any initial uh, plays or maybe even a ball screen. So if the, let's say the offense is dribbling, y'all back up. Let's say the offense is dribbling and he's trying to get us into the offense. What I tell a lot of players is you never want to reach with your arms you always kind of want to just give him a subtle step. All right, so if I'm in a good defensive stance and I'm low and he's dribbling, I may just try to flick and try to hedge at him. Now that's going to keep him more alert and more than likely he's going to try to get rid of the ball. Okay, so one of the things we like to do with that initial jab is we're trying to time that dribble. So if I'm a player and I'm calling out the plays and I got a defender up, you want to try to time that jab. If you can get him to retreat or try to pick up this offhand, all right, that's gonna allow you 
to have the advantage and being able to try to turn that defender if he was to try to blow by you. Okay, so we'll just each go at it. Okay, so you try to time this dribble. Up, good, try to time it. Up, good, don't reach. Good, don't reach. Up, good, hit, there you go. Jab, jab, good, next, next. Okay, so keep your base nice and wide outside of your shoulders width. Don't reach in with your hands. Just give him a simple jab. Try to force him to pick up his dribble or retreat. Up, up, good, up, good, up, good, good, next, next, next. So being mindful of how fast did the point guard or whoever is handling the ball, try to time that dribble. Be patient, but at the same time, be, be effective with changing your speeds with that jab. If I'm dribbling a little slow, he's trying to size me up slow, slow, and then if you strike fast, good. That's gonna force me to sit, uh, try to step back or go right into my retreat dribble just to make sure I'm not turning the ball over. Another technical move that I like to share with all my players is understanding how to utilize the karaoke step. Now, many coaches may have different philosophies of how to take away the first step dribble if, if the player is attacking. But for me, my theory is always to try to get my right shoulder outside of his right shoulder or vice versa. So depending on which uh, ball, depending on which side the ball handler is dribbling, if he decides to attack, sometimes just being able to keep that traditional uh, open step will allow him to be able to penetrate, get to his spot and his angle, and being, being able to veer into me, which will allow him to get to the second level. So one of the biggest things is, is the anticipation. But instead of me just simply stepping to the spot, I wanna bring my outside foot over similar to a karaoke step. Now that's gonna allow my left shoulder to get outside of his left shoulder, forcing him to turn the opposite direction and allowing me to play straight up. So if he decides to attack, I'm going left side, cut him off. Now if he opens up the angle, I'm trying to go chest to body and just play straight up. Okay, so this will help with your anticipation. Trying to just work on cutting off that first step or that first dribble and turning that, that offensive player will allow you the help side defense to recover. And now you guys are gonna be able to sustain and keep the offense where you want them. All right. Up, good, step up, inside. Good, a little bit quick, I had you on that cross. Keep that base wide. You wanna make sure also that you keep your base wide. If your feet come too close together and you raise your level, that's where your feet may get tangled up and, and that's where you get crossed, all right? So make sure you keep your base nice and wide. Long step, up, good, inside. Right here. Good. Quick first step. Up. Thank you. Tap. Up. Inside. Good. There you go. One, two. Couple more. Up. Inside. Up. Good. There you go. Good. Good. Cut me off. We're always trying to go left shoulder to left shoulder or right shoulder to right shoulder. Up. Inside. Up. Good. Good. Keep those keep the feet wide though. Wide, wide, wide. Up. Inside. Good. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. All right. That's it. Thank you. All right, so understanding that practice makes perfect. In order to be able to master this and being able to be an elite on-ball defender, the only best scenario is through trial and error. Allowing yourself to, to continuously practice this in a one-on-one -on -one setting, three-on-three, -three, or even a five-on-five -five will allow you to become a better on-ball defender. Hey guys, it's Coach Damon. And today we're gonna bring you a drill series to work on becoming a better one-on-one -on -one defender. Now, very similarly to becoming quicker with your release or working on certain moves. The best way to become a defender, assuming that your footwork and your technique is down, is to put yourself in situations where you're at a disadvantage defensively and then you have to find success. So we're gonna start very simply. Now I'm gonna assume that you know how to close out, you know how to chop your feet and close out with your hands high, you know how to open your hips and talk and all those small details are things you've already mastered. So once you've mastered those, this series is to then start working on those to translate that work into in-game success. So in your drill, we're gonna have a coach, we're gonna have a defender on the block, and then we're gonna have an offensive player on the wing. Now as a coach, I'm gonna say shot. Now as soon as I say shot, he's gonna very quickly rotate his hips, he's closing out, and we're playing live from this spot. Now our only rule is, for the offensive player, is he can't go dribble crazy. So we're not gonna say there's a dribble limit of three or four, but if he goes eight, nine, or 10, it's a win for the defense. So if we go through it a couple times live here, we're ready, shot, closes out, Great job, great closeout, forces a miss. Notice how his hands were up, he chopped his feet. So we go through it again, shot. That's great D. 
That's a very tough shot. That's another win for the defense. We'll do it one more time through. Notice how perfect his closeouts are every single time. Shot. Great job. Great job, great defense. Great defense. So that's three straight wins for the D. Again, I, notice, I know that when you watch that through, you're concerned with the result of the one-on-one -on -one possession. But notice how each time he closed out, his hand stayed active. Those small details that coaches talk to you about, he was doing every single possession. Now our next drill in the series is gonna put the defense at a huge disadvantage, where to start the drill, they're not even gonna know which direction the offensive player is gonna go or where they're gonna end up. So we're gonna start with two players and they're both gonna be right underneath the basket. So as they come here and slide in, they're gonna to start to the side to get started, but they're here. And the offensive player is gonna have his head right underneath the backboard. Now the defensive player is gonna be right in front of him. The defensive player and the offensive player are both gonna be looking at me, and the offensive player is gonna put his hand on the defensive player's back. Now this drill starts as soon as his hand comes off. So as an offensive player, you can go right, you can go left. The only rule is gonna be you can't catch it right now inside of the paint, so he can't just step and seal. So as you can imagine, defensively, he's gonna be at a huge disadvantage because he's gotta locate, he's gotta feel, he's gotta go in which direction he goes, and then from that point, he's gotta close out and play great defense, even though it starts in such a chaotic, disadvantageous situation to start. So if we go through it here, again, offense is gonna start the drill. As soon as that hand comes off, that's a great closeout. Great recovery, great recovery. Let's go a couple more times through. That's great defense. We go again, great job, hand down, and man down. Notice he put his hand down for a split second, and that's all it took for the shooter. One more time through. Great defense, great defense, great defense. I almost went in. Now, as a defensive player, this can be a very frustrating drill but you're putting yourself in a situation from the beginning where you're hopefully never gonna be in the game or your back is to your man and you have no idea where he's gonna go. So by putting yourself in that box, by putting yourself at a huge disadvantage, you force yourself to get better, quicker, and smarter as a defender to make sure that you get that stop. Now our last drill in the series is again gonna put the defense at a disadvantage in a different situation. So now our offensive player is gonna start in the corner and our defensive player is gonna start behind the baseline. Now their feet are both gonna be stationary or stagnant and the defense cannot move until the offensive player moves. Mm -hmm. Now as soon as the offensive player moves, he's gonna be sprinting and tracing the three point line towards the coach. Now he's not gonna be allowed to face cut or back cut because he's obviously in a position where he could get that every single rep through the drill. But if we walk through it, as soon as his feet move, he's up, I'm gonna hit. When he catches, this time he's gonna have four dribbles to score. Now as an offensive player, you can try to mess with the defensive player and you might lean or jerk and try to get him to move his feet. Now, if the offensive player gets the defense to move his feet, so if we watch right now, if Wayne moves and we get the defense to move their feet just a little bit, then no matter make or miss, the offense gets to keep the basketball. Let's go through it a couple times live. Offense will keep it no matter what, he's got four dribbles to score. Great take. Great move, great D. Let's go, two more times through. So that would have been an offense keeps it no matter what. Defense has to react. Big time shot, big time shot. And last time through. Great D, that's great defense. So we talked about in all three of those drills, the defense is starting at a huge disadvantage. They don't know where the ball's coming from. They're starting literally behind the offensive player, but they have to find ways to be successful. If we put these guys out here and they played straight one-on-one, -on -one, he'd play, be in a great position every single time. But we wanna put him in a disadvantage, put him in a situation where he shouldn't be successful and then force him to find success on a way to becoming a great defender. Hey guys, it's Coach Allen and I'm here with Coach Christian and we're gonna give you five exercises you can do anywhere, even in a small amount of space, to improve your defensive speed and explosiveness. Uh, if you want more playing time, and I don't think I've ever met a player that doesn't want more playing time, the surest way to get that done is to become the best defender on your team. Uh, part of being a defender is just having that relentless tenacity of wanting to stop your opponent. Part of it is having a, a high basketball IQ so you know what your opponent's gonna do in advance and you can anticipate. But a good portion of it comes down to your athleticism and being able to improve your speed. So Coach Christian is gonna show you right now five exercises to improve your defensive speed. Yes, sir. So 
One of the biggest limiting factors for us sometimes is being able to be in a good ready position. What I mean by good is in a low enough position, right? If our center of mass is tall and we try to change direction or produce force, we are not going to be efficient. That's where injuries start to happen and that's where you start to get beat off the dribble, right? So to help increase our range of motion here, I'm gonna go ahead and start by putting my ankle out in front so that my knee and my ankle are in a straight line and that my knee and my hip are in a straight line here. I'll do the same thing for my back leg. I'm gonna put my knee and my hip in a straight line and then my knee and my ankle. So I got two 90 degree angles working right here. Now as I'm here, I can use my hands, I can use a med ball, I can use anything I need to to help press into the ground if we're a little tight here. I'm gonna go chest first towards my back knee and then I'm gonna go hand on my front knee and just think wide knees, wide knees. You see I sneak my opposite hand in and slowly let my opposite leg drop down into the ground. I'll use my hands to reset my base position. And then again, upper body first, lower body second, and then I'll just let my hands facilitate how well and how slow my knees move. I'm thinking here about five times, five reps over each hip. So a total of 10 rotations and 10 switches. Every single time that we switch, let's hold for a couple seconds. Let's make sure we feel comfortable here. Maybe a deep breath and then chest, then lower body, and then slowly rotating over to the next side. Now, that was one purely for range of motion. Yep. Not that much tension in it. But now that we're gaining some range of motion, we gotta start building some capacity, right? We gotta start building a little bit more tension and strength in this position. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna frame my front knee. So I'm gonna go belly button, face up with my front knee. My hands are framing my front leg. I'm gonna think belly button all the way diving out in front of my knee. Big dive, big dive. I'm most likely gonna feel that stretch on the outside of my front hip. When I get here, I'm gonna push my knee into the ground. I'm gonna push my shin into the ground. Hold there for five seconds, and then I'll press back up. I'll do five reps just like this. Again, belly button, folding all the way out in front of my knee. When I feel like I get that big stretch, perfect. Hold it there, now push your knee down. Now push your shin down. Push this front hip down. And then again, I'll press myself back on up. I'll do five reps on one side, and then I would fold over and do the same thing on my next side. Again, belly towards the front knee, hold at the bottom, pressing into the ground here for five seconds before I press myself back on up. Beautiful. Yep. So that's the first one, and that's working mostly on range of motion and hip mobility. What's yep. our second exercise? Yep. Second one now is going to be here with the plate. Okay, so I'm gonna be doing some more lateral uh, redirection stuff here. Okay. okay. So the first one I'm gonna do is just really focusing on my planting, right? Because of course, uh, change of direction is a big deal in defense, right? Yep. So if we're not able to plant appropriately, then chances are this dynamic movement of back and forth isn't gonna work out too well. So we're gonna pause ourselves right here, right? I get a couple slides and then I press. And again, I want to make sure you saw on that one, I was a little shaky. But what I want to make sure that as I'm sliding and as I press, my weight, my center of mass is right inside this bent knee. That I'm not allowing my torso and things to step outside of my bent knee. So I'm going to get five reps on each side with a violent punch outside of that, of that base knee. I'll do five times on each side. And again, short distance, right? We don't need that much space. Right. That one, I think I got two or three shuffle slides in between. That's more than enough. And if you don't have a plate, we could use a book. You could use a med 100%. ball, anything. Anything with a little bit of resistance. Yeah, perfect. this is only like five pounds right here. So that'd perfect. be perfect. And right now we're in a beautiful weight room with turf, but this could mm -hmm. be done on the court. This could be done just 100%. about anywhere where there's a flat, safe surface. Exactly. Love it. Exactly. What's number three? Now, number three, now we're going to turn this into a little bit more of a capacity drill. Okay. So we know that we're able to plant and absorb force the way we want to, right? Our yep. center of mass is lined up appropriately. Now we're going to make this a little bit more dynamic. Ah. I'll go about, again, three to five reps on each side. Yep. Any time I start to realize that my center mass gets weird or that I'm reaching my leg out and not sinking right into that bent knee, that's when I know I need to take a rest. Yep. I need to think about where my body was, become aware of how my body was moving, and then make those adjustments as needed. Love it. Next exercise. Yep, next exercise. So, now, Shuffle slides, side to side. A big part of that, right, has to do with the ability to produce force laterally. Yes. So, what we're gonna work on is a single leg bound towards the lateral side of the wall. 
So as I'm here, I want to think about loading right, right into this hip. So I'm thinking throw my hip to the back corner. Hip to back corner, land. And again, we've already talked about landing. Yes. Right? If we don't land well, we're not going to produce well. So don't just get into this jump and stick it tall. I want to still load as if I'm trying to change direction. So I can start tall, load, pop, land. What's a couple of coaching cues on the landing? On the landing. If our heel is coming up off the ground when we land, yep. chances are our head is probably too much forward. So maybe eyes up so that the chest can come a little bit taller there, right? And then another thing is as I'm hopping, I want to get my work done early. So this leg here, if I know I'm going to land in a bent knee position, I don't want to reach mm. and then bend into it, right? That's taking more time. Yeah. So I want to start to bend this knee as I take off so that right when I land, my hands are back. And that's the only thing that needs to move after that. Gotcha. There's no earthquake, there's no movement once I make contact with the ground. Love it. And our fifth and final exercise. Fifth and final exercise, we're gonna work on our sumo squats, right? So if I have a weight, awesome. Book, med ball, something, awesome. I'll hold it right here out in front of me, okay? If not though, I'll show you this just body weight. My toes are purposefully facing out to the side. My heels are a little bit wider than hip width apart. I wanna think wide knees, wide hips, as I drop down, hold for a couple seconds, and then come up tall. What's usually going to want to happen? As I drop, my hips, ankles are gonna get tight, so my butt's gonna start to push back. I wanna force my butt and my hips to stay right underneath my shoulders. I'll get down there to the bottom, hold for a couple seconds, and then come up tall. So now we're kind of just working on the strength aspect. Now we're working on how well do all my quad, glute, hamstring, adductor muscles able to turn on in a low position. Again, I'm thinking 10 reps right here. I'm thinking three rounds. Great to do right before you go out onto the court or also just as a uh, auxiliary movement during your lower body lifts. Love it. So there's five exercises and drills you can do with very limited space. So you can do them just about anywhere to improve your defensive speed. And I've also found through experience, one of the best things to become a better defender and improve defensive speed is to play one-on-one -on -one against someone that is a better player than you are, or more importantly, someone that is faster and quicker than you are. And that way you'll be able to take everything that Coach Christian just showed you and you'll be able to apply that to very game specific reps. So hope you guys enjoy and hope you become the best defenders possible. Hey guys, it's Coach Damon, and today we're going to bring you two drills to become a great on-ball defender. If you see guys in the NBA or at the college level who are great on-ball defenders, they are constantly dictating to the offensive player where they want them to go. Whether that's turning them, whether that's forcing them to certain spots, they never seem to be where they are guessing or where they're on their heels, where the offense is dictating to them. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you two drills that put you in a situation where you're going to start on your heels or where you're going to start guessing and you're at a huge disadvantage. And then from that, it's going to force you to become successful because you're going to have to react very, very quickly to beat to spots and then turn. Very similar to your offensive game, and we talk about this a lot. If you want to be a great defender, you have to be willing to fail if you're then eventually going to become successful. Now for our drill, we're going to start. If you have a volleyball line and then the high school three-point line, those are great reference points to start. But the defender is going to start with his toes on the high school line. And then the offensive player is going to start with at least one foot here on this volleyball line. Or if you don't have those reference points, we're about three feet apart from one another. Now the offensive player is going to have a live dribble. He's got that live dribble. He can do whatever he wants with the live dribble. But the defense cannot move their feet until the offensive player moves his. So you can try to manipulate him. You can try to get him to move. And if he moves his feet prior to him moving his, the offense keeps the ball no matter what. Now, if the offense scores, you keep the ball on offense. If the defense gets a stop, you're gonna earn your way to offense and you're gonna play to four at three separate spots. The top of the key and in each wing. Let's watch these guys go through it a couple times. He's got a live dribble. Great defense, that's great defense. There's a stop, there's a stop. Live dribble. Great step back, great contest. We'll go one more time through. Great take, great take. Notice how in all three of those scenarios, the defense was at a huge disadvantage. He's only three feet apart. He has to make sure that he's active on his feet, although he can't move them. He's dialed into the offensive player's midsection, then he's ready to move quickly. Now in our second drill, we're gonna make it even more difficult on the defense because the offensive player is gonna be able to move prior to attacking the rim. 
So as an offensive player, I'm gonna stay in a straight plane. So I can use this white volleyball line as a point of reference. And I'm just gonna be back and forth, continuously crossing, continuously crossing. Now as a defensive player, he's gonna glide with me or he's gonna be in that defensive slide. But he cannot step forward until my feet cross this white line. So very similar to our first drill, the offense is dictating to the defense when they can move, obviously with the ability to shoot or drive at any time. So the defensive player has to be able to react, he has to be dialed in, all the while knowing that he can't steal or deflect the ball when in a game he may typically try to do so. So if these guys go through it a couple times, straight line glides, that's tough to react, let's go one more time. Straight line glides, defense has to be able to react. He's watching his midsection. There we go, great defense. Great D, great D, that's a great one to end on. Anytime you force yourself to fail, you're building a foundation to then later be successful. And if you play one-on-one -on -one against guys you can always beat and lock up, or the only type of defense you play is going, doing lane slides for time, if you're unwilling to get beat, you're not gonna become an elite defender. So with these drills, you're gonna force yourself to sometimes get beat and sometimes fail. And I guarantee you that's the best way to then translate your training into in-game success. My playing level just skyrocketed. Anyone that's serious about playing basketball needs to get EGT. I would describe it as the best training program in the world. This elite guard training program, like it creates a monster in you. You got experience it, it's just on another level. The best decision of my life was to buy the first EGT program.